So welcome, we are now in week nine to Math 140 Business. This is, I think, lecture number 15, pretty sure. And I'm gonna share my screen here and we are gonna start on the two major concepts remaining in the semester, which are confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. And everything we do will be done with a calculator or a computer. We do not do these by hand, although we could, the formulas are not that tough, but we're gonna start chapter 16 is called confidence intervals. The basics. Chapter 16, confidence intervals the basis. So what exactly is the idea behind a confidence interval? So conceptually, we start with the following. There's an unknown parameter, usually a mean mu or a proportion P. Okay, so there's something that we're looking for. We're looking for a mean of a population because remember parameters only go to populations. So we're looking for the mean of a population or the proportion of a population. We're looking for mu or P, but we don't know it, it's unknown. So what do we do? We wish to estimate the parameter. So how do we estimate a parameter? How do we estimate a parameter? Take the sample size and then... Well, take a sample, right? We estimate the parameter, so we take a sample. Right? Take a sample of size n. And then what do we do with that sample? We calculate a statistic. And use that statistic usually. X bar or P hat to estimate the corresponding parameter. Now, suppose the population is every car in America. And suppose the parameter you're interested in is the average mile per gallon for every car in America. Is it feasible to test every car in America to calculate the sample, to calculate the true average miles per gallon? Is that a feasible uh, endeavor? No. No. So let's say we take a sample of let's say a million cars, a pretty large number, a representative sample, it's a nice random sample. And we average that sample and we get 26.3. Do you expect that 26.3 to be ballpark around the true value? Yes. Sure, pretty large sample, why not? Do you expect that sample, that 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 statistic, twenty six point three, to be the exact value of the parameter? No. No. So rather than giving me one number as my estimates, wouldn't it make more sense to give a range of values to give me an interval of values? Yes. Okay. So we extend the point estimate. 
to an interval of estimates. And say with some level of confidence that the true unknown value is somewhere in that integral. This is the concepts behind a confidence interval. Chase, I see you, you're late. While we're doing that, uh, Jonathan, Ara, Aiden, Jorge, Elise, or Jasmine, if any of you are here, send me a message. So this is the idea of what a confidence interval is. Okay, what is that word next to unknown? True or value? True. So we extend the point estimate to an interval of estimates and say with some level of confidence that the true unknown value is somewhere in that interval. Now, well, that's, that's, that, those are the ideas. So, so next, what are the factors that should, um, that should matter in determining the interval, the confidence interval for a, a certain um, for a certain populate for a certain parameter of a population. What are the things that might matter? Right, we, we have a parameter, we don't know it. We're curious, what is this parameter? We take a sample, we calculate an estimate, and then we wanna create an interval around that estimate. What are the things that might play a role in determining this interval? Give me anything that you can think of that might play a role in determining this interval. In this example or in examples in general? Examples in general. But certainly this example here. Well, I feel like in this example, maybe like you can find find what the av like average size of the car might be. Well, I'm saying your your data are just are just your values. So we're curious what the average miles per gallon is. We take a million cars, we calculate their averages. We have a list now. We have a, a, a pamphlet of all of these numbers, and we use those numbers and we've calculated our average. And we say the average is 26.3. Now let's construct an interval. And so the question is, what's going to play a role in determining the size of that interval? How far left, how far right we go? So we're not looking population for- Population size? Sorry, was it? Population size? Okay, so that's a good guess. The population size, actually, that does not play a role. Okay. But, okay, the, it's a good guess, though. The population size actually does not matter in determining the confidence interval, as long as- the, the ratio of sample size to population size is not too bad, but we're not going to worry about that. So what other factors might play a role besides that? Number of cars? In the what? Uh, so we're saying like uh, the 26.3 is the miles per gallon. We're calculating yeah. like cars, right? So yeah. the number of cars like would, would give us like from, from this to that. The number of cars where? On the road? What do you mean the number of cars? Uh, in general, just like how many cars it is. No, the number of cars is the population size. I just said that does not play a role. Min and max values, good guess again, does not play a role. And this is fine. We're going to guess. It's okay to be wrong, but we're guessing here. We're looking for the things that are going to play a role in determining the confidence intervals. I've had three guesses so far, min, max, and population size, none of which end up actually playing a role in this calculation. Median? Median, again, did not play a role. But this is great. 
in a certain region area. No, I'm, I'm looking for more general, so not specific to this problem, just in general. Unknown parameter, you take a sample and we use that sample to get a confidence interval. We're looking for things that might play a role. I'll give you one of them, sample size. The sample size, yeah, number of sample, why is I got it? Number of sample, the sample size is something that's gonna play a role. The sample size N plays a role in determining the confidence interval. What else might play a role in determining the confidence interval? There's a correlation. Correlation between what and what? Between the like the number of cars and like the miles per gallon or uh no that that no number of number of cars just your sample size in this case okay okay so the other ones that play a role are the confidence level how confident do you want to be that you caught it if you want to be 90 percent confidence that you caught it that's going to create a different size confidence interval than if you want to be 95 percent confident that you caught it or 99% confident that you caught it, or 100% confident that you caught it. What else plays a role in determining the confidence interval is your statistic itself. The statistic, your estimate of the parameter. If we get different estimates, then we're gonna have different confidence intervals, even if everything else is exactly the same. And the fourth thing that matters is the standard deviation, the standard deviation, or better yet, the standard error is a little better than standard deviation. And I will explain as we do problems, basically the standard, the standard deviation, standard error is the standard deviation of the sample. So we want the average of the sample, or we want the statistic, we want its standard deviation, we want the confidence level, and we want the sample size. Those are the four factors that play a role in all of the confidence intervals that we're gonna do. We're gonna do, I think, eight confidence intervals and all of them, these are the four things that play a role. Now, let's think about the effect that each of these four things does have on the confidence interval. So you took it, you took a, a sample, you get an estimate, and you want to perform an interval around that estimate that you claim the true value is somewhere inside. The true value is somewhere inside the interval. And you have four things that determine the interval. You have the statistic, the estimates, the confidence level, the sample size, and the standard error. First, how do you think the statistic itself plays a role? What effect does the statistic have on the confidence on the uh, confidence interval? So we got 26.3. That was our statistic. That was our estimate of the parameter. How do you think that affects the confidence interval that we're creating? I, I think it might affect like the midpoint of where you would start. Exactly. The statistic, the point estimate is always right in the center. Point estimate is in the middle, the exact middle. The parameter itself that you get as your approximation of the true value is the center of your confidence interval, which means that the confidence interval is going to equal, or is going to be, I guess maybe equal to bad word, but the confidence interval is going to be from x bar, or from the, uh, we'll use x bar as an example, x bar minus something to x bar plus something. x bar minus a little bit, that goes to the left to x bar plus a little bit, or p hat minus a little bit to p hat plus a little bit, or, and we have all the other situations that we're gonna come across. But your confidence interval, the center of your confidence interval is the point 
estimate that you get as your statistic itself. If you can only give me one guess as to what the true value is and not give me a whole interval, there's nothing better than the point estimate that you got, your estimate of the parameter. Now, as the sample size gets bigger, do I expect the interval that I'm creating to get bigger itself? Remember, bigger means more options. If I want to be confident that I caught it, right, the bigger the interval is, the more options it is in terms of what I think it might be. I know it's somewhere in there. So the wider it is, well, the more possibilities. So as the sample size gets bigger, do I expect my confidence interval to get bigger or smaller? Smaller. Smaller, which means that the sample size is in the denominator. So that as n gets bigger, the thing that I'm adding or, small, or, or subtracting gets smaller. And it turns out, it turns out to get to, to actually depend not on the sample size itself, but on the square root of the sample size in ways that we're not gonna prove. We're just gonna go with it. Next, the standard error, the standard deviation of the sample or the standard deviation of the actual population itself. As the spread of the population gets larger, when I create my confidence interval, do I expect more uncertainty in the population to correspond to a wider confidence interval or to a smaller confidence interval? A wider? Wider. So the standard deviation actually is going to appear, but it's going to appear on top, sigma or whatever other, um, I'll just, you know, actually I'll do SD just to be more general. SD for standard deviation is gonna appear on top because as we're gonna see, different situations have different formulas for the standard deviation. So we see that the uh, standard deviation plays a role in the numerator and the sample size plays a role in the denominator. So the next is the confidence level. This one's a little tricky. As the confidence of catching the true parameter goes up, do I expect the confidence interval to get smaller or to get wider? Wider. Excellent. If you want to be more confident that you caught it, make your net bigger. Imagine you're going fishing, right? If you have a very small net versus a big net, which one is going to give you more confidence of catching the true value? The bigger net, right? In fact, if I want to be 100% confident, I'll just take it from negative infinity to infinity. Okay, I'm 100% confident it's in there. It's not very useful, of course, because if the whole point is to narrow it down and you're saying it's between negative infinity and infinity, thank you very much. I didn't really need your help for that. I could have done it myself. But the confidence level, again, the more confident you are, the wider it's going to be. So the confidence level also, I'm going to call it C star for now, because we're gonna see the different situations. We're gonna have Z star, we're gonna have T star, okay? So this is the generic formula for confidence intervals. So you multiply, right? You, you multiply, yeah. Okay. It's, it's in the numerator. It's in the numerator. Okay, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go through different scenarios. Now, the book does not do it the way I do. For chapter 16 of the book, it does one confidence interval. And then as we go through the next five or six chapters, it does it here there's one and here there's one and there there's one. What I like to do is teach all the confidence intervals at once and then teach all of the next topic, which is related to but different than comp confidence intervals all at once. So what we're gonna do right now is go through the various scenarios of confidence intervals. So scenario number one, and this one actually is in chapter 16. It's the one that they use um, as their example, uh, which we're gonna use as just um, um, the first scenario. So scenario number one is um, to take an SRS, 
from a population with unknown parameter, unknown proportion, I should say, because this is a specific scenario, unknown proportion P Uh, with an unknown proportion P, period. A level C confidence interval for P is P hat minus Z star, the square root of P hat one minus p hat over n to p hat plus or minus z star square root of p hat one minus p over n assuming both n p hat and n times one minus p hat are 10 or more. This is our first scenario. Okay, you have a population. We do not know the proportion. We have no idea what it is. Let's say you are a Kobe Bryant fan. You think Kobe Bryant is a great uh, basketball player. And you say, I am curious what his, um, what his free throw shooting percentage was. Now, of course, we have the data for it. We can look at how many free throws he took and how many he made. But again, that's just a sample because in theory, he could have taken a lot more, right? So we don't know the true value. So the best we can do is we can form a confidence interval for the true value. In this situation, there's a lot of symbols and it's really important to know what everything is. So what is P equal to here? And what is P hat equal to? And what is N equal to? And what is C equal to? And what is Z star equal to? We have five symbols appearing in this formula and we better know what all of them are. So somebody give me one of them. One of them should be really easy. P is proportion. What proportion? Huh? What proportion? The unknown proportion? Yes. P is the true unknown proportion. We do not know it. We will never know it, which is why it does not appear in our formula. Because if you don't know it and you can never know it, how are you going to use it? So P, the true unknown proportion. Excellent. Someone give me another one of these five symbols. C is confidence interval. C is at the confidence interval. The whole thing is the confidence interval. C is what's called the level of confidence. My bad. It's okay, I forgive you. The level of confidence. And usually it'll be 90% confidence, 95% confidence. If we're really, really you know, worried, maybe 99% confidence. But the level of confidence will be provided the level of confidence will be provided. What is N? Number of samples. Yeah, not number of samples. Sample size. Sample size. So N is the sample size. And what is P hat? The known proportion? Well, if P is the unknown proportion, why would I say, oh wait, what did you say it was? I'm sorry. I said the known proportion. Be more specific. The proportion you're trying to find? No, P is the proportion I'm trying to find. The proportion you already have from, from your stats? Yes, P is a sample proportion. 
P is the one I got from my statistic from my data. And I took my statistic. That's P hats. Very important distinction. P is a true unknown proportion. I don't know it. So I'm finding a confidence interval for it. But in the confidence interval, I use P hat, which is my sample proportion. That's the one that I actually do know because I have my data in front of me. Oh, I took 10 free throws and I made seven of them. So my P hat is seven tenths. You know, that's the actual, excuse me, that's the actual proportion. And then we have Z star. And the question is, what is Z star? Would it be the confidence uh, percentage you want? Yes, but the question is how we find it. So let me show you how to find it. Now, of course, we only got to do this once because once we find it, we never have to find it again, we have it. So we're gonna do it for three scenarios, okay? We're gonna start with 90% confidence. We're gonna start with a 90% confidence scenario. And I want you to imagine a normal curve. And we're gonna shade in the center 90%. So the center, the center 90% is over here, right? This part, oh, this is not gonna work. Let's try this, uh, really dark, okay. And much better. Okay, the center 90%. So how much is over here to the right? 5%. 5%. So what number cuts off 5% on the right side? What's Z score? This is the standard normal. So zero, one. This is the standard normal distribution. What number? cuts off 5% to the right. 95. Uh, the number 95, you think this number? 95%. Well, but I'm looking for the Z star. I'm looking for the actual. 1.28155. And can you tell me how you got that? I put the inverse norm 0.90. If you did the inverse norm 0.90 on the left, is it 90% on the left? Or the right? Um, I did it. I think my calculator does it from the left. Well, if it's from the left, how much do we want to the left at this point of this number right here? Oh, it'd be 10%. To the left? Okay. To the left? Oh, sorry. How much is to the left of the number? Of, how much? 90. Oh, no, sorry. It'd be 95. 95%. Even though it's a 90% confidence interval, this number here that cuts off 5% on the right wants 95% to the left. So what number gives 95% to the left? Point ninety-five. What's Z star? What's Z? What does Z score is 95% to the left? We've done this before. You guys should have this. What Z score gives 95% to the left? 1.644. 1.645. Yeah. Can you tell me how you yeah, got actually, that? Yeah. Uh, I went to the calculator inverse norm, and then the area I put 0 0.95, mean zero, just uh, center deviation one to the that's left. It. And then that's it. That's exactly it. So for a level of confidence of 90, Z star is just the number 1.645. There's no calculations that ever have to be done again. If Z star, sorry, if the level of confidence is 90%, then Z star will always be from today to the end of time, 1.645. So 90% confidence implies 1.645. What about 95% confidence? A 
If I imagine a curve and I want the inside to be 95%, what is this number right there that cuts off 95%? 2 point. Oh wait, you want like the percentage on each side? Well, no, just give me the number. If you don't oh, okay, just give me one second. Would it be 1.958 or one, sorry, 1.96? 1 1.96 is correct. So anytime we have 95% confidence, Z star is just 1.96. And what about 99% confidence? Would that be 2.58? 2.576, I think the book uses. Okay. But yeah, I mean, essentially 2.58. Mm -hmm. So again, these numbers only have to be calculated once. Once you have them, you can always use them whenever you want. But the Z stars, now, of course, on a test, if I said use 82% confidence, then you have to, you know, you have to calculate it. But notice how. For 90% confidence, we don't use 90 in our calculator, we use 95. For 95% confidence, we don't use 95, we use 97.5. Because these diagrams dictate why. Does that make sense? Of course, in your calculator, you don't gotta do this. You just put in how much confidence you want and it pops out the answer for you. But this is the first scenario of a confidence interval. So let's do an example. Let's do an example. So here's an example from the book. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here and I'm gonna start sharing in the book in the, um, on my computer. Okay, so example 16.3. It says, how common is behavior that puts people at risk for AIDS? In the early 1990s, the landmark National AIDS Behavioral Surveys interviewed a random sample of 2,673 adult heterosexuals. Of these, 170 had more than one sexual partner in the year prior to the survey. That is, P hat, which is the proportion of whatever it is that you're looking for, in this case, uh, uh, um, adult heterosexuals in my sample that satisfied this criteria was 170, 170 successes over 2,673 in my sample or 0 0.0636. Is that a bird I'm hearing? Yes, it's, um, yes, it's a bird. It's a plane, no, it's a bird. Anyways, okay, so based on these data, what can we say about the proportion of all adult heterosexuals who had multiple partners in the year prior to the survey? So if you look at our formula here, you'll notice that we need P hat, Z star, and N. If you have those three things, P hat, which appears three times, Z star, and N, we can calculate our confidence interval. Do we have P hat? Yes. Yes. Do we have N? Yes. What's N? The 2,673. The 2,673. It's the sample size. Do we have yeah. Z star? Uh, I guess. Is it the 170? No, 170 is the number of successes. That's got nothing to do with my confidence. Oh, Z star comes from my confidence. So, so far in this question, 
I do not have it. So let's keep going. There it is. We will estimate the proportion of all adult heterosexuals who had multiple partners by giving a large sample 95% confidence interval. So now that we know that we want 95% confidence, do we have our Z star? Yes. yes. What is Z star? 1.96. 1.96. So of course we do got to check that N times P hat and N times one minus P hat are both bigger than 10 and they are. And then we go down to our formula, P hat plus or minus Z star times the square root of P hat one minus P hat over N. And we just plug everything in. And we get 0 0.0636 plus or minus 1.960 times the square root of 0 0.60636, one minus that over N. And we do the math and we get down to here at the bottom. This minus this is 0 0.0543. This plus this. Can we put it down more? I can't see it. I don't know why. I don't Sorry. Can you, okay. You, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. So um, at the end of the math, we got 0 0.0636 plus or minus 0 0.0093. This minus that is 0 0.0543. This plus that is 0 0.0729. So the interval is from this number to that number. And what do we conclude? We are 95% confident that the percent, the true percent of adulthood heterosexuals with more than one sexual partner in the year prior to the survey is somewhere between 5.43% and 7.29%. Can, can I see where you where they got 0 0.0636? Right here. Oh, okay. P hat okay. is the sample proportion, the number of successes over the sample size is your sample proportion, 0 0.0636. Make it together, I was just, I was just. Okay. That's all right, it's all good. Does that make sense? Yes. So this first example that we did, this first scenario, we're gonna label, back here at the top, we're gonna label this scenario one is the large, sample uh, proportion, which would certainly imply what? That it would be more than 10 for the NP hat. Oh, well, as, yes, but I was thinking, which would certainly imply that there should be a second scenario when it's not a large proportion. <laughs> But yes, um, it certainly implies that it's um, it's uh, um, that n times p at and n times one minus p at are both going to be um, uh, greater than or equal to ten. So, any questions on scenario number one? Uh, for the Equation, why did he put P hat minus uh, Z star? And then on the other one, you put P hat plus or minus Z star. Just... Oh, 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 that's a mistake. That's a mistake. Okay. That should have been P hat minus on the left and P hat plus on the right. P hat's in the middle. You subtract it to go left. You add it to go right. Yeah, I was just confused because I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was a mistake on my part. Okay. So that was uh, the first, that was an, ex uh, an example of the large sample proportion. So let's go now to scenario number two, which is gonna be the small sample proportion. Small sample proportion. Okay, so just like before, we're gonna make the conditions on the situation. Take an SRS of size N from a population that contains an unknown proportion P 
<clears throat> the small sample or plus four confidence interval for P, it's either called the small sample or the plus four confidence interval for P is the following. Just like we had before, we have the small sample or plus four confidence interval for P is gonna be P hat minus Z star. Well, take that hat, make it a, make it something some, uh, um, sorry, change it to uh, twiddle. Or what, what's that little thing called a tilde? In math, we call it a twiddle, which I like, it's a better, ugh, better word, P twiddle. Minus Z star, square root of P twiddle. 1 minus p twiddle over n plus 4 to p twiddle plus z star square root of p twiddle 1 minus p twiddle over n plus 4. Do we see why it's called the plus 4 confidence interval? Yes. So there's only one question you should be asking right now. Well, you can ask more than one question, but what question should you be asking right now about the situation? Why did we choose the number four? That's a great question, but no, something else. Do we always have to assume it's 10? So Lorena, uh, that was going back to the previous question, right? N P at and one minus, and, and N times one minus P at, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they have to be more than 10. If they're not, you go to this one. Okay. This is a small sample situation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No problem. So yes. What is P twiddle? <laughs> That's a great question, right? We just introduced a new symbol. What is P twiddle? So P hat is number of successes. Number of successes over number of or over sample size over sample size, that's what P hat was, which is X over N. X is the number of successes, N is the sample size. P twiddle is gonna be X plus two over N plus four. Number of successes plus two divided by the sample size plus four. Why plus four? Great question. You got to go with it. I'm not even sure why it's plus four. I just know from people that I've spoken to that it gives a better confidence interval for small samples, but I don't know why. And I don't know why it's four and not five or three. I don't have an answer for you. But the plus four confidence interval is very similar to the first one. The only difference is, is that we don't use P hat which is number of successes over number of, over the, over the trial. We use P twiddle, which is number of successes plus two over the sample size plus four. And when do we use this? Use this if um, N is greater than or equal to 10. The sample size, must be, I don't care about n times p hat and n times one minus p hat. I just need a sample to be bigger than or equal to 10. Okay, as long as a sample is greater than or equal to 10, I'm, I'm happy. Okay, so this works for much smaller samples than the other one does, where n times p hat and n times one minus p hat must be greater than or equal to 10 each. This one, as long as n is greater than or equal to 10, I'm perfectly happy. So let's do an example. I'll use one from the book, but I'm not gonna just show you the book. I'm gonna do it from scratch together. So here's a question from the book. Cocaine users, 
commonly snort the powder up the nose through a rolled up paper currency bill. Spain has a high rate of cocaine use. So it's not surprising that euro paper currency in Spain often contains traces of cocaine. Researchers collected 20 euro bills in each of several Spanish cities. Ooh, 20 euro bills. Okay, I'll probably need that information, 20. Not sure what it is yet, but they have 20. In Madrid, 17 out of 20 contain traces of cocaine. 17, another number that might, be, that might prove useful. 17 out of 20 contain traces of cocaine. The researchers noted that we can't tell whether the bills have been used to snort cocaine or have been contaminated in currency sorting machines because you know, you, you sort through bills, they're gonna come in contact with another. Anyways, the question is, estimate the proportion of all Euro bills in Madrid that have traces of cocaine and use 95% confidence. So C is equal to 95% confidence. So in this example, what is 20 and what is 17? Of our variables, what is 20 and what is 17? 17 would be our X and then, Seven. well, I'm talking about for the equation for P um, twiddle. Well, I mean, X appears in both. X is still X, right? So if X yeah. is still, okay. And what's 20? 20 would be our sample size. Yes, exactly. 20 will be your sample size. So 20 is N. So what is P hat? I'm just curious. 17 over 20. 17 over 20. So what is P twiddle? It'd be 19 over 24. 19 over 24. What's my Z star? 1.96. For 95% confidence, 1.96. Am I allowed to use the large sample proportion um, confidence interval? The first scenario, am I allowed to use that one? No. Why not? 20 times um, P hat would be 17. 20 times P hat would be 17. That's greater than or equal to 10. Oh, actually, then wait. Oh, let me... Can we use uh, the... Uh, the the second one? Wouldn't be equal to wouldn't be greater than ten. Okay, the other one would be greater than equal to ten. What would the other one be, by the way? Three. Three. Can I use the small sample or the plus four sample? Yes. Well, yes. Why? The sample size is greater than 10. Okay, the sample size is greater than or equal to 10. I can use it. So let's go ahead and calculate it. We have p hat, sorry, we have p twiddle, which is 19 over 24, minus z star, which is 1.96, the square root of p twiddle, 19 over 24, 1 minus p twiddle, 5 over 24, over n plus 4, which is 24 to the same thing, except for the plus sign in between. And that is your confidence interval. Does it make sense? Yes. Questions for everyone else? Uh, I was going to say, why are we using P twiddle if both of our values are greater than 10? Both of what great values are greater than 10? N and X. N and X are not what have to be greater than or equal to 10 to use the large one. What has to be greater than or equal to 10 to use the large one? Uh. N and P hat. Not N and P hat. N times P hat. 
n times p hat, which is the number of successes, that's x by the way, n times p hat is equal to x. And what is n times one minus p hat? That's the number of failures, that's n minus x. In this example, what is x? 17. That's greater than or equal to 10. What's n minus x? What's n three. minus three? Is that greater than or equal to 17? I'm sorry, is that greater than or equal to 10? No. No, and that's why I can't use it. On the heat, does that make sense? Yeah. Everyone? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know what these numbers are. I really don't care to be honest what these numbers are. It's just an example. You can certainly take out a calculator and do it, or better yet, let's take out our calculator and do it. So where do you think we go in our calculator for these? Would it be stat? Stat, followed by? Would it be test? Tests, followed by? Z test? Nope, not a Z test. Or Z interval? Not a Z interval. I know you might think it's a Z interval because we have the letter Z in there, but it's not. Keep going down. Oh, the is it two sample Z test? Uh, this isn't this isn't two samples, just one. Keep going down. Oh, one prop. One what? One prop Z test. What does the prop stand for? Proportion. One proportion Z interval. Right, it's a one proportion and it's a Z because it's a Z star interval. Now, when you click that, it asks for how many things? How many things do you have to provide for the one proportion four? interval? Or the P interval. Um... Oh, wait, 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 wait. I only have three in my calculator. What four? Yeah, it's three. I have, uh, oh, never mind. Yeah, it's three. Okay. Now, now, the easiest is going to be the C level. What's the C level for this example? 0.95. The X and N sound easy, but they're not. They're always not trivial. What do you think we use for X and for N in this example? X and N? We don't. 19 and 24? Yes. In this example, the X is actually the 19 and the N is the 24. If you're going to use the small sample one, mm -hmm. you have to fix your X and you have to fix your N because your calculator doesn't know what you're doing. Okay, so the X and the N that you use, basically, they have to be the ones that appear here in your, in your first term. Those are what you're going to use for the X and the N of the calculator, even though we're not calling them X and N. So what do we get as our confidence interval here from where to where? What does the calculator give us? 0.62919. Until where? 0 0.954. Exactly. So we are 95% confident that the true number of bills in Madrid that contain traces of cocaine is between 63% and 95.5%. Now that's a fairly wide margin. Why do you think it's such a wide margin? Due to the small sample size? Due to the small sample size. Let's go back to the first scenario that the book did for us. Oh, we didn't, I didn't actually write it down, but let me share my screen again. And let's find it. It was confidence intervals. 
it was this example here, right? So let's go ahead and with the calculator, let's find our one proportion Z interval for this first example. What was my X in this first example? 170. 170, what's my N? 2,673. What's my confidence level? 95. So put it in, what, is it, what did it give me? From where? 5, 4, 3, 5. Until where? And point zero seven two eight five. How does that agree with what the book gave me? <laughs> How does that compare to the book? Uh, it's close. It's, I mean, uh, up yeah. until rounding, it, it's the oh, same Oh yeah, they thing. round it up. Yeah, so it's good. Right, up until rounding, it's the same thing. So how easy was that? On the calculator, compared to actually writing out these formulas and computing these things, right? The calculator makes it so much simpler, correct? Professor, so uh, I'm putting it on my calculator. I'm going to start test and number five. Well, who's a five? Uh, anyway, five. We're not doing a Z test. We're doing a Z interval. You want to go down to should to, be A. To a. One proportion of hey, Z interval. Tests come later. Now we're doing intervals. So we go eight? Oh no, a. eight. A, a like a. apple. A like apple. A like Aardvark. Wait, so we gotta, we gotta, it's like class, I wait. So we go to stats and then we go to stat test. And uh, then we where gotta, do we go? You go down to one proportion Z interval. Okay. Okay. And all you need to do is three things X, N, and the confidence level. Okay. Those three things, and you're done. You don't need anything else. Okay. okay. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, let's share my screen again. So now we have essentially what is the inverse question. The inverse question says as follows. So first, the definition. The margin of error, the margin of error for a confidence interval is the plus or minus part. Okay, so whatever you're adding and subtracting, that is the margin of error. So for our examples, for our First two scenarios. For our first two scenarios, the margin of error is equal to Z star sigma P hat one minus P hat over N or possibly Z star sigma P twiddle one minus P twiddle over N. Okay, those are the margin of errors for our first two scenarios. And the margin of error, the margin of error is how, basically how uncertain you are in your confidence interval. Like, okay, this is the value that I got, plus or minus this. So it, uh, it can be on this side or that side by this amount. In general, what do you wanna do with those margins of errors? Do you want a big or small? You want them smaller if you can't have them smaller. Yeah, if you, can, if you can make them smaller, you want them smaller, right? So for a given level of confidence, for a given level of confidence, prior to taking your sample, what can you do to shorten your future, because you haven't done it yet, your future confidence interval.
prior to taking your sample, what can you do to shorten your future confidence interval? Anyone? You can uh, lower the confidence. No, oh, for a given level of confidence. Yeah. You can't lower the confidence. For a given level of confidence, what's the one thing you can do to shorten it? Increase the sample size. Increase the sample size. Increase the sample size. So follow-up question. How big of a sample do you need for a specific margin of error? In other words, if I come along and I say, I'm only accepting a margin of error of 0.1. I want this confidence number to be really tight because I really want to get my, my value. I really want to be really confident that I have it, but I don't want to have a big interval. I want a very small interval. For a margin of error of 0.1, how large of a sample do you need? Would it be 90% of the, the, the size? Uh, of, the, of the population, you mean? Yes. Uh, no. But I love where you're going with this. But why 90%? Why specifically 90%? I was thinking like, uh, the, like subtract um, 100 by the 10%. Uh, wait, uh, so, but again, no. So, so um, I mean, I, I like the guesses. I love it. Uh, even though you're wrong, it's totally fine because it shows you're listening. It shows you're trying. It shows you're, you're, you have an idea of what's going on. Um, it's not so obvious how to, how to do this. Um, but again, great that you're trying. What we're going to do first is we're going to take our margin of error formula and we're going to solve it for n. What do Professor, I do? On yeah. the, uh, sorry to interrupt. On the margin of error formula on the top, uh, yeah. on the p twiddle part, don't we put the denominator as n plus 4, or we just keep it yeah. as n? Yeah, n plus 4. You're right, n plus 4. Thank you, thank you, thank you, n plus 4. In fact, what we're doing now, we never use a small one anyways, because um, if you want to get a certain margin of error, you're always going to have a large sample. So we don't have to worry about that, which is why I don't use it often and I made that mistake, but yes, 100% correct. So for this m equals z star squared of p hat one minus p hat over n, what do I do to both sides to get n by itself? What's the first thing I do? You're trying to get n by itself? Yep. Do you divide c, uh, do you divide c uh, star from... Okay. So m over z star equals the square root of p hat one minus p hat over n. Okay, what next? Then you square root it. Uh, I don't want to square root it. I want to get rid of the square root. You square it. I can square both square sides. Root. M over z star squared. I'll leave you with plus or minus. No, no plus or minus. Not when you square. Squaring yeah. makes squaring makes things positive. You don't have plus or minus. Yeah, so that's only when you square root. Yeah. So if m over z star squared equals this, what now? Could divide by p parentheses one minus p? Could, but that won't get me right away where I want. It's a little easier if I flip both fractions, I think. But again, there's more than one ways to get there. I flip both fractions and then I multiply by uh, p hat one minus p hat. So I get n equals p hat one minus p hat times z star over m squared. And we have the formula for n. Um, but there's only one problem with this formula. And it's a big problem, by the way. What is the one major, major big problem with this formula?
Anyone see it? It's a big, big problem with this formula. Do we have our margin? Is it given for yep. us to? Yep, yep. For a given, for a um, for a specific margin of error, for a given margin of error. Right. We're trying to figure out how big of a sample you need to be certain that your margin of error is going to be that small. Would M and Z X be the same? What do you see X? I mean Z star. I mean. No, no, no. Z star is 1.645 or 1.6. Oh, okay. Those are the Z star levels. M is your margin of error. Two totally different things. There's something major, major, major. Is it because? What does that say? Prior to taking your sample. Yeah, what does this say? The number of. Uh, your sample, wait. Well, size of your sample equals? The sample size. Yeah, what does that equal? The sample size? Yeah, what's that formula say? Sample size equals what? Uh, uh, your, your, your statistic that you got from your sample already, correct? Yeah, how, how exactly can we have a formula before I take my sample that requires something from my sample to calculate it? Do you see how that might be an issue? Yeah. Okay, so how do we get around this issue? So the answer is we do one of two things. So if we somehow have any prior knowledge of what P might be, use it for p hat so if somebody comes along if the problem says a sample taken three years ago in a study in africa says that p is 0.36 and you want to take a sample yada 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 then you would just use 0.36 because you have prior knowledge and they will have to give that to you Otherwise, use one half for p hat. If you have any prior knowledge, use it. If not, just use one half. And for those of you who have taken calculus, anyone here taking calculus? Me. So the reason why it's one half is because if I want to maximize that between zero and one, it turns out that I get a maximum value when P is equal to one half. So if we're erring on the side of caution, we're going to err on the, the largest possible sample size, which you get when P hat is one half. Okay. So that's just the rationale behind it. So if we somehow have prior knowledge, use it. Otherwise, just use one half. Okay. So let's just do a quick example. Example. Gloria Chavez and Ronald Flynn are the candidates for mayor in a large city. You are planning a sample survey to determine what percent of the voters intend to vote for Chavez. You will contact an SRS of registered voters in the city. You want to estimate the proportion peak of Chavez voters with 95% confidence, boom, 95% confidence, and a margin of error no greater than 3%. So your margin of error cannot be bigger than 0 0.03. How large a sample do you need? So how large a sample do you need in order at 95% confidence to guarantee that your margin of error is no bigger than 0 0.03? Answer, go to your formula. N equals, do we have any prior knowledge of what P might be? No. Not at all. So one half, one minus one half, which again is one half, 
times z star, which is what? Point nine five. Z star uh, is 1.96. 1.96. Again, guys, Z star and the confidence are not the same thing. 90% confidence, Z star is 1.645. 95% confidence, 1.96. 99% confidence, 2.576. They're not, oh, they are not the same thing. So we have 1.96. What's the margin of error? 0 0.03. 0 0.03. They got a calculator. There's no trick to this one. You just got to do it. 1.96 divided by 0 0.03. I'm going to square that. I'm going to multiply by one half twice. So I'm going to multiply by one fourth. And what do I get? What do you get? What do I get? I got 1,067.11. Yeah, 1,067.1 bar. Now, okay, so you decide to go out and you're gonna ask 1,067.1 bar people. Of course, finding a one bar person might be a little tough because people can only come in holes, right? So we round, what do we round to? One thousand one hundred. Uh, yeah, but I could do that. I could do one thousand one hundred, but now I'm spending a little more money than I have to, and spending a little more time than I have to. You would just one thousand one thousand seventy sixty-eight. Yeah, sixty-eight. Well, I guess the real question should be: Is it one thousand sixty-seven or one thousand sixty-eight? 68, so you could be lower than the margin or they wanted? Yes, yes, you always go up because going up makes the margin of error smaller. You're okay with making the margin of error smaller. Going down makes the margin of error bigger. You're not okay with that. So it's not rounding. You're legitimately choosing the one that decreases the margin of error. So you never go down, no matter how close to the number you are, you always go up. So I would, if I wanted to get a value, and when it comes to voting, it might be very important. If I want a value that's no more than 0 0.03 points away in either direction, I would need to take an SRS of 1,068 voters. If I wanted 2% margin of error, it would be more because I'd be dividing by a smaller number, right? The smaller the margin of error, the larger the sample size. You, as a person running this campaign who wants to get accurate data but not spend more money than they have to, your job is to come up with some middle ground that, um, you know, that, that works. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so? Yes. Yeah. But you would have to ask way more people, right, just so you could get that exact number of people. Well, yeah, if you're, if you're worrying about things like under coverage, non-response and all that kind of stuff, then certainly you'd have to ask more people to, to overcome that. You need 1,068 responses. So yeah, so that's of course also a concern because I don't know about you, every now and again, I'll get something from CSUN saying that they're, they're taking a survey of something and they want you know my vote, what do I think? And I just delete them, I don't got time for that. And I teach statistics and I know how important it is. And even I don't got time for that. So um, you can imagine people out there in the world feel the same way. But then again, if you feel strongly about something, maybe you would vote. I don't know, everyone's different. Anyways, this is chapter 16, which is the basics of confidence intervals. We covered two scenarios. There are six more scenarios. If you look at your calculator, if you go to stat, tests, and you go down, how many of the intervals have we covered?
on your calculator, the intervals go from seven, eight, nine, zero, A and B. That's six settings on your calculator. But as we one. saw, huh? We only been through one. Well, we've been through one and two different scenarios. So what we really saw is that even though the calculator only has six settings, we see that really behind the scenes, there's at least seven settings because one can be used in two different scenarios. Mm -hmm. A different one can be used in two different scenarios. So there really is eight examples and we did two of them so far, but they're all the same. They're all based on the same idea, which is take out your calculator, plug in what you know into the right scenario, and if I know this, I don't know this, I want this, I can't afford, whatever the case may be, you got to know the right scenario. And if you know the right scenario, we'll let the calculator do all the work for you. Are we going to do all of them like this semester? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. Why? You didn't like it or you did? Huh? You didn't like it or you did? No, I mean, I feel like it's faster than like what we were doing before with the calculator. Well, what's faster? Like this. Oh, you mean the calculator is faster? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, this, this particular thing, it's much quicker, yeah. um, but also, you know, as you're getting better, you're going to do things quicker, right? So there's, there's two reasons why it might be faster now, but yeah, all of them, if you look at any one of them, even let's say that the two sample T interval, but even the two sample T interval only requires one, two, three, four, five, six, eight inputs. Mm -hmm. Now, so far we've only had three inputs. Right, so when we do that one, we'll have eight inputs, but they're gonna give you what those eight inputs are. So as long as you can recognize what they give you, mm -hmm. just plug it in and your calculator will do all the work for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any questions on this? No. Okay, um, the people who have not yet who didn't take the test because we were sick, I had a few uh, people who were told not to come to campus because uh, the, the the system the system um, didn't allow them to for 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 COVID reasons or whatever. Um, I would like you to stay when everyone else goes, so we can talk about how you're going to make up the test. Because um, I can't give you the same one. Obviously, the answers are already out. The rest of you, I will see you on Thursday, and we will continue. I'm also going to put up the 16 homework, so you can start it tonight. Um, it should be relatively straightforward because all these questions are essentially the same. The only way it will be tougher is if they didn't give you the results, they just gave you the data and you'd have to input it. But so far we haven't had a scenario that requires that. So the other scenarios will, these ones don't. So they will take a little bit longer, but not too much. Anyways, I hope that made sense. And if you have any questions, um, we'll like to stick around and wait, you know, feel free. Otherwise I'll see you guys on Thursday. I will.